Prinhandar uh, Kroiso, good afternoon and welcome. And thank you for joining us today for this Cardiff University event. We have a wide variety of people joining us today from across the UK and around the globe, Pontypridd to Pakistan, to name a few. I also want to extend a special welcome to alumni who are currently involved in our WE Mentoring programme. This is the latest in our four alumni by alumni live event series, where we hand over the webcams and mics to our fabulous alumni to share their thoughts, expertise, passions, and experiences on topics which will inspire, engage, and spark curiosity within our community. This event is being recorded and we'll send you the link in our follow-up email. So my name is Hannah Sterrett. I am the alumni and supporter engagement officer at Cardiff University and fellow alumna of the university. And it is my privilege to introduce you to today's speakers. So Professor Karen Holford is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Cardiff University and Professor in Mechanical Engineering. With a career that spans industry and academia, Karen has particular interests in facilitating industrial collaborations in research and teaching, inclusivity, equality and diversity, championing of interdisciplinary activities and the development of early career researchers. In 2015, Karen was elected as Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and 2016 was named as one of the top 50 most influential women engineers in the UK. In 2018, she received a CBE for services to engineering and the advancement of women in engineering. Perhaps among her proudest achievements was earning her VEng and PhD from Cardiff University in 1984 and 1987 respectively. And Sue Charman Anderson, she is the founder of FindingAda.com, which inspires and supports women in STEM. She runs Ada Lovelace Day, an international celebration of women's achievements in STEM, the Finding Ada Conference, an online event covering careers, equality, and widening participation, and the Finding Ada Network, an online mentorship program. Previously, Sue was a social technologist and as one of the most one of the UK's social media pioneers, worked with clients worldwide. A freelance journalist, she's written about social media, technology and publishing for The Guardian, CIO magazine and Forbes. In 2005, Sue co-founded the Open Rights Group, a digital rights campaigning group. As its first executive director, she prepared the organisation's response to the Gowers Review of Intellectual Property and gave evidence on digital rights management to the all-party parliamentary internet group. Sue studied geology in what is now our School of Earth and Environmental Sciences, earning her BSc in 1993, and for many years she's been living in the USA where she joins us from today. So before I turn to our esteemed panellists, I'd just like to remind our audience that if you do have any questions for Karen or Sue this evening, please enter them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and please in your answer let us know where in the world you are right now. I also thank everyone who's already submitted questions in advance, which I'll ask during the Q&A section of the evening. So I'll now hand over to Karen to lead this evening's discussion. Welcome. Thank you. So welcome, everybody, and thank you, Dioch Hannah. So welcome, Sue. Um, thank you, Hannah, for the great introductions. And it's so lovely to be here tonight in conversation with Sue. So lovely to see you. And it's great to talk to you, to you, all, you know, across the, across the, um, the ocean. Um, this continues the university series of events to um, celebrate Women's History Month. So it's lovely to be here with you. And, uh, you know, listening to um, Hannah introducing us both as, as alumna, alumni of Cardiff University, it made me think about my time in Cardiff. I'm, I'm here in Cardiff today, obviously, but my time as a student in Cardiff was very different. I've got really fond memories of the things we used to get up to as students. Um, you know, fond memories of um, the Woodville pub, for instance, the Students' Union, Alexander Gardens and so on. So, so what do you remember, Sue, about your time as a, a student in Cardiff? Um, firstly, uh, thanks for having me, Karen. Um, I have some very fond memories of Cardiff, both the, the city and the university. Um, I remember the Woodville pub uh, really, really well because I lived on Wood Woodville Road for a while. Um, I think what has really stuck with me was um, I used to write for the uh, Gayatri uh, newspaper. So um, I did quite a lot of um, writing, did a little bit of photography. Um, I do remember kind of like learning how uh, a dark room works, learning how cut and paste layout works. And, and this was, we were just starting the transition to uh, computing, computer edited uh, newspaper. So we were still printing things out and cutting them up with scalpels and sticking them together again, which um, all seems very quaint now. 
Um, and, and I'd actually say that uh, that experience of working on our gallery uh, really helped when I decided as a sort of slight uh, detour on my career path to uh, become a, a freelance music journalist. I at least, I, you know, I had a good portfolio to, to show the um, editors at the, uh, the Melody Maker where I uh, freelanced for a couple of years. So I have very warm memories of that, definitely. Well, that's amazing. So Melody Maker was one of the um, magazines that I used to buy regularly. So I probably read your articles without even knowing it. So that's great. I think it's interesting what you say about picking up those skills along the way that you, you know, by volunteering and by doing things that are, are fun and interesting at the time. And you never know what skills are going to be useful in the future. So, you know, students, I, I would always urge students and I always do urge students to take any opportunities that are open to you if you think they're going to be fun and helpful. So, I mean, Cardiff has changed so much. Um, so when were you last in Cardiff and what does Wales as a country mean to you? So I came back over in 2018 for a 25 year uh, reunion with some of the folks from my degree. And that was really interesting to, to come back and, uh, and, and, and see how the city had changed. I've been back quite a bit um, before then, uh, partly because actually my um, husband was doing some work with someone at the university in the, the School of Journalism. So we would sort of like come back and I'd take any excuse to um, mm -hmm. visit Cardiff. Um, and, you know, I, I love Wales and, and you know, I have gone back as, as frequently as I could. Um, I actually did start learning Welsh um, some years after I left Cardiff. So my timing maybe wasn't so smart. Um, and I'm now kind of, uh, I guess, kind of like a, a, a maybe advanced, intermediate advanced learner. So I, I can read books. I'm not so good at speaking because I don't get much practice in America, oddly. Mm. But that's really inspiring. And, and I think I'm sure you can find people amongst the community here to practice with. So picking up conversations with people. I'm, I'm learning myself. I've been learning for years. I don't seem to get any better, but I, I do try. <laughs> so great. Um, so we've got loads of things that we can discuss. Um, so before I get to that, so you're in Cleveland now, you were in Cardiff. So how did you go from Cardiff to Cleveland? I guess the, the husband was involved somewhere. Yes, very circuitous route. Um, spent a lot of time in Reading um, when I moved into uh, technology in the late 90s. I started learning how to uh, design web pages. Um, and then that developed into working with social technology. So when people hear about social media these days, they tend to think about marketing, but actually, um, in sort of 2004, 2005, a lot more of it was about knowledge sharing, knowledge capture. So working internally with businesses to improve internal communications um, and, and kind of community building, but you know, with businesses internally. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. That was, um, it was really good. Uh, it was, you know, it got a little bit challenging um, once sort of Twitter and the marketing side and, and Facebook Sort of took over um, but it was actually while I was um, executive director of the open rights group I met my husband who's American and then in 2014 we moved to the states to be a little bit closer to his family he'd not seen them for a long time and just to sort of experience life in another country which is always a, a fascinating thing to do. Yeah definitely yeah so before we got into get into details about um, the work that you're doing at the moment, um, you know, and Ada Lovelace, uh, what an inspiration to everybody. But I've noticed many of my friends and, and colleagues are uh, reporting babies and they're saying, I've called the baby Ada. And in fact, the name Ada has now returned to the top 50 babies' names for the first time since 1924. Um, and so there must be a link to this trend with um, Ada Lovelace is by my bicentenary in 2015 so so you know what a legacy that you you've given us there what a legacy to have any any comments about that uh, Sue? Well, I've certainly had people say to me on on social media that they've named their daughter Ada because of Ada Lovelace which is is delightful I do understand there's a character called Ada in Peaky Blinders as well so mm -hmm. I'm wondering thinking that might also have an influence but I like to think that people are honoring the first computer programmer when they name their daughter it, it is a, a great name um there's that there was actually we lived uh in Wisconsin near a town called Ada as well so um uh, I, it's 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 lovely to see people 
um, taking such a historic name and, and using it now. Yeah, it is lovely, isn't it? So then on that note, so could you please tell us, for those who don't know, who was Ada Lovelace and what does her legacy mean to you and for all women in STEM? Ada Lovelace is really one of the most fascinating historical figures that I've read about. And, and you know, there's quite stiff competition there. She's a really interesting person. She was the daughter of Lord Byron, uh, the, the romantic poet, and his wife, Annabella, the Baroness Wentworth. And they had a very short marriage. Uh, Annabella fled Byron's abuse when Ada was only a month old. So she never knew her father. But her mother uh, had her schooled in science and, 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 and um, maths, uh, really to try and make sure she didn't develop any of her father's poetic tendencies. And she went on to become friends with Charles Babbage, who had invented first the difference engine, which was a uh, mechanical calculating machine, and then went on to invent the analytical engine, which was a mechanical computer. And it really was a very complex and sophisticated machine. And Ada Lovelace was one of the very few people who truly understood its importance. Um, she translated a paper by Luigi Menabria about the analytical engine. Um, he'd written it in French, she translated it into English. And Babbage was so delighted with her translation, he suggested that she add her own notes as she understood the machine so well. So she tripled its length with her footnotes. And one of those footnotes was the first published computer program. It's a program to calculate Bernoulli numbers. So she takes the algebra, uh, breaks it down into its simplest components. So just addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, uh, works out how that would be encoded into the punched cards that would control the analytical engine and thereby proves that the machine was capable of figuring out an answer that had not been programmed into it beforehand. And that was groundbreaking for the era. But more than that, she understood that if the machine could manipulate numbers, it could manipulate symbols. And if it could do that, you could program it to do almost anything. So she was like, we can program it to do art. We can program it to create music. All we need to know is how to break those processes down uh, algorithmically and turn that into a series of calculations that we can run through the analytical engine. What really astonishes me about Lovelace though is that she did all of this without a working computer. She never got to run her program, she never got to test it, she never got to iterate, all of those things that programmers take for granted now. She was working off designs designs and conversations with Charles Babbage and to be able to come up with a program which does run um, and to have that vision of understanding what computing could be it really that way of thinking wasn't truly grasped it wasn't really appreciated until Alan Turing in the 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Sue, for that, that really great summary. And, it, you know, she was truly amazing, absolutely exceptional intellect. And as you said, you know, to do that without actually testing her programs herself. And it makes me think, you know, what would she have achieved had she been alive with that with that intellect today and, and have the have the today's computing power because computers have moved on so much in the last 30 years haven't they i think anybody from my era who's on the line today will remember us having punch cards you know so it took quite a long time the advances took a long time didn't they so when i was a student we were still um, using punch cards and carry them across park place to be taken across to the computer you know just unbelievable how, how much it's moved on since then Gosh, yes. So anyway, moving on. So um, I do a lot of work, as you do, in terms of, um, you know, raising awareness of, of careers and, and um, you know, women in STEM and so on and supporting women in STEM. But quite often there's an expectation that, that various aspects of female empowerment um, should be charitable. Um, mm. So, so what, why do you think there is that expectation? I think this is a, a, a serious problem that as a, a sector almost, if you like, of the widening participation sector, we really need to grapple with. And I think a lot of this expectation comes down to the fact that women's work in general is, is not valued. We still don't value um, caring 
the the pair that women do for their children but also increasingly now for their their parents and, and elder relatives we we don't appreciate um you know, female coded and female dominated areas you know teaching nursing these sorts of things and so i i feel that when we're looking at issues of gender equality it is seen as a a women's problem for women to solve for women and because of this it is 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 very much kind of looked down upon and and, and seen as not valuable um and in fact i was having a, a friend a chat with a friend of mine recently who was saying whenever he covers diversity issues in his newsletter his open rate drops and so we have this kind of challenge about what do we value and pay for in our society you know footballers uh, actors musicians you know if, if you have the talent and perseverance then you can earn a ludicrous amount of money um, if you are working at a, a, a level of you know, trying to improve the world for people, um, and that's not to say that actors and musicians and footballers don't, but you know, as a society, we don't really value it. And so we don't see why it should be paid for in the same way that we would pay for a brain surgeon or a plumber or other areas where expertise is, is required. And, and I've always been very keen that with Ada Lovelace Day and all, all of the work that we do, we always pay our speakers. We might not be able to afford to pay them very much, but we always pay them. And that's really unusual in the event space. Most conferences that I speak to, I don't even get offered a fee, but I made it a, a point of pride because there is no, there's just no way I can talk about empowering women if I'm then exploiting women's free labor that that's to me that would just be wrong um and so i run everything as a, a normal for-profit business um because i see ada lovelace day the finding ada conference these are events and they are no different to other events that are run commercially just because my focus is empowering women doesn't mean that my speakers don't deserve to be paid for their expertise, doesn't mean that I don't deserve to be paid for my work, you know, and it doesn't mean that our sponsors don't get value out of it, they do. So for me, it's it's almost like a, it's a partly a point of pride to run it like that, but it's also about trying to push back against this idea that women's labor is, um, is not valuable, that, that it doesn't have worth, because you know, we need to make the point women's labor does have worth. That's a really important point and I'm sure there's lots of people listening to this who have are totting up the countless hours of voluntary um, work they've done in terms of um, equal rights and, and not just gender issues, you know, other issues as well in terms of because we're all expected because we have a personal expertise. It's ex I, th I think it's some, something about being, you know, in our interest to do it so therefore we'll do it for free. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we, our, our passion is making sure that um, the next generation don't have the same issues that we've had. And so people, yeah, you're right, it's, it's, it's kind of exploiting our, our passion for, for, you know, for change, isn't it? But, but that, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that the whole kind of exploiting our passion for change is like, there are other areas where people are highly passionate, again, actors, musicians, footballers, all known for people who are extremely passionate about their sport or their music. And yet we don't expect them to uh, work for nothing. Um, maybe, you know, with musicians, it's a little uh, different, but there's still an increasing push towards we need to value uh, the creative industry. We need to value the people who make music, who write books, who make art, who develop computer games. Um, you know, that we, we don't in other areas take passion as an excuse to not pay people. So we really need to rethink how we view those people who are working towards equality. And, and it, as you say, not just gender, but all, all axes of, of diversity. Yeah, thank you. And, and I guess this brings us on to your company then. So finder Ada, uh, FindingAida.com. How did you start this up? It and, really, uh, how do you fund it? <laughs> yeah. So we are, um, we're mainly sponsor funded. Um, and 
that's that's something that kind of rose organically. Um, I, I started Ada Lovelace Day in 2009, late 2008, the first tweet goes out where I'm kind of thinking, mm, I'm going to do something, not quite sure what. Um, and I came up with this idea of having a day of blogging about women in technology because I'd seen so many conferences with either with very few female speakers or none. And a lot of excuses from conference organizers. You know, we asked everyone, they all said, no, oh, there aren't any. I was like, what do you mean there aren't any? I, I know loads of women in tech. Of course there are women in tech. So my idea was, if we had this day of blogging about women in tech, every time a conference organizer said, oh, we can't find any women who are expert in, then we could point to a load of blog posts and say, there you go, knock yourself out. Um, it immediately uh, just, got out of hand in, a, in the best possible way. Um, I was expecting it to be me and a couple of friends and I ended up on the BBC News, um, I, in loads of newspapers, uh, people got hold of it and just, it's time had come and I just sort of seemed to hit the, the zeitgeist. And so we ended up with 4,000 people registered to write their blog post on the 24th of March, 2009. And after that, it just snowballed. Um, and I do honestly feel like I've spent much of the last decade kind of running to catch up with where it's organically gone. So, um, you know, people organize their own events now. We've had anywhere between kind of 150, 200 events every year, literally around the world. Every inhabited continent takes part. We've had events in, in Uganda, Kenya, uh, India, um, in Nepal, in South America, um, you know, everywhere in, in a lot of events as well now in non Anglophone countries. Um, so, uh, you know, Albania, Turkey, uh, places like that. And I just, it, it really has been amazing to see how people have embraced um, the day and embraced the idea. And we always get a lot of press participation as well, which has been fabulous. But when you start something as uh, a concept, you know, a movement, you're not necessarily thinking about how it's going to survive financially. And it started off very much as something that I would you know, try to do in my spare time over the summer. Um, it shifted to the second Tuesday of October. Um, really, in, I think it was like the second year because I realized I just wasn't going to be ready to do it in March. Um, so it's very much been something that I have retrofitted a business onto um, and so obviously sponsorship was the obvious kind of like, okay, this is, this is an event, we can get sponsorship for this, we would normally in a non pandemic year be doing a live event in London. Mm -hmm. And so being able to bring people together to see women talking about their work and sharing their expertise in a sort of theatre like setting so you know, you can have a drink and uh, we normally have a book signing we make it very relaxing and enjoyable. Um, and that's obviously something that we can um, attach sponsorship packages to. Um, over the last year, obviously, we've had to get a little bit more inventive, which is where the Finding Ada conference came. So this is a fully online conference. Um, and again, really what we're looking at is supporting women with careers advice and also supporting gender uh, equality advocates with information around how can you widen participation how can you um you bring people from different communities in um and, and looking at sort of hr and policy issues as well so we try and be quite rounded in in, in what we look at um, and then obviously the finding ada network which is a subscription mentoring network and so i've been working with some um uh, companies and universities to um, facilitate mentoring. So we've been working with JP Morgan, uh, with the University of York and with um, a company in London called the Information Lab. So a lot of this has been, okay, you know, we, we have this movement, it needs funding somehow because work needs to happen to sustain it. Um, and then just over the last years, you know, I tried uh, podcasting, um, uh, publishing books, um, you know, all sort, you know, merchandise, all sorts of different things to try and see what business model would fit. Um, and I've now got to a point where you know we have these three things that we do, and everything fits together like sort of nice, neat little jigsaw. Um, and it's all starting to really kind of like come together. But um, it's it's been a challenging journey because I I didn't start off to do this. Um, I I started off with just a random idea that took off. 
Yeah, and it's brilliant. What's success? I just, you, we, you talked about, um, you know, working with industry and academia um, and, you know, with your campaign group. And I just think I, I'm always trying to get those three groups together um, more. Uh, and, and do you have any tips really, or do you have any advice on how we could, we could bring those three interested parties together more, more easily? Yeah, I'd like to see a lot more collaboration between industry, academia and grassroots organisations. I mean, you're not just uh, finding Ada, but there's so many great grassroots organizations and quite often you see them sitting in the middle and they, they tend to like face towards industry um, and then industry and academia kind of work together but we never seem to connect all the dots and I think what we really need is is for some companies to step up to the plate and say right okay we need a much more cohesive approach to widening participation um, industry ultimately is benefiting from the work of grassroots groups they're benefiting from the low paid and unpaid labor of minorities women and other minorities because um you know when you're looking at how um you know we support women in the stem fields a lot of that work is being done unpaid in universities by women who are passionate about it um, and by activists who are again either low paid or unpaid volunteering um, and who ultimately benefits from an increase of women, businesses who can then hire them, because we know there's so much evidence that businesses that have a more diverse leadership are more profitable. Mm. So they're not, they're not looking to hire women out of the goodness of their heart. They're looking to hire women um, and again, you know, other minorities, because having that diversity of thought results in better decision making, better product design, better service design, better execution, and more money. Mm -hmm. So they need to, I think, have a bit of a, a think about paying back to the community. But I think as well, maybe grassroots organizations and universities could work more closely together to, to make the case to industry to get involved and to think about how can we do this kind of 360 view and actually see how with there's so much overlap that's going unexploited mm, yeah i totally agree with you it's, it takes a bit of coordination doesn't it but it's certainly mm. possible and um, so, so we're nearly out of time we've just got a few minutes before we open up to questions but i guess um what you know one of the things i'm quite often asked is my tips for for um a, a alumni early in their careers or maybe students who are on the call um you know yeah and any tips for how to get on in stem i think two main tips firstly is find yourself a mentor um i'm obviously quite biased because i do run a mentoring network but i have seen firsthand the impact that a good mentor can have um, we have uh, one woman who found her first job post-graduation through uh or because of part of her mentoring um yeah that was her mentoring goal um but having someone to talk to, to listen to, to help you focus on exactly what your goals are and how to reach them is, is so important. And it doesn't have to be um, uh, through a formal scheme like ours. I mean, it really can be sort of anyone. It can be a little bit daunting to find a mentor. So really you have to network. And that's the other tip. I was very shy um at university i was not very good at making contacts i was not very good at net networking at all i found it quite intimidating and and that continued through my 20s until i realized that honestly no one else is paying as much attention to me as i thought they were mm -hmm. so you know you have this fear of public humiliation you don't want to make an idiot of yourself so i'd rather stay silent than say something stupid and actually when i figured out that no one was paying that much attention, it made it a lot easier to just talk to people and say, well, you know, this is what I do. This is what I'm interested in. What do you do? What are you interested in? And then look for people where you make a connection and then ask them if they will be a mentor because, and again, the fear of asking can be huge, but most women would love to be a mentor, but they aren't asked. Mm -hmm. So we have kind of, you know, both sides kind of going, oh, a bit reticent, not sure we want to make this connection. But actually, if you push through that and you ask, then you will generally find that women are really keen to, to help. Um, and, and particularly around issues, the sort of soft skills, you know, how to deal with, um, you know, your first role, whether you're an early career researcher or you're moving into industry, you know, there's an awful lot of unknowns 
and an awful lot of um, you know support that a mentor can give you just tackling your day-to-day -day experience because you know when things are new um, you, you really do benefit a lot from someone slightly older just going ah yes I experienced that and this is how I solved it yeah. Um, so yeah find yourself a mentor and network yeah I totally agree with you great well on that note I think Hannah's joined us for some more questions yeah thank you both so much for such an engaging discussion I'm sure we could talk for hours on any of those topics so I really appreciate your time um, I would like to open the Q&A now so if any of our webinar attendees haven't done so already please do ask your question below um, I'll start with one that's been submitted in advance which is who are your role models or women who inspired you in your own careers? Um, Karen, would you mind answering that first? Um, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, uh, so, yeah, so many, so many role models. I think, you know, it goes back to family, doesn't it? And, and my mum was a bit of a role model for me and, and actually my dad as well. Um, not a female role model, obviously, but you know, their, their um, work ethic and their um, sense of social justice and their sense of, um, you know, right and wrong. So that instills in you your values and behaviors, I guess. And um, one of the things they always used to advise me was um, you can do anything, but do what makes you happy. And I think sometimes that's really good advice to, you know, if people are in a quandary about decision making or, you know, it, it, and, and also about taking on unpaid roles. You know, I do take on unpaid roles if they make me happy, but I won't take them on if they won't make me happy. You know, so that's um, that's something. So, yes, um, mum and dad and um, also all the fantastic engineers that have gone before me. You know, I know some really brilliant engineers and um, female engineers who've just been totally inspiring to me too many to mention but um one, one i will mention is is um Anne downing who was um head of engineering at cambridge and she remains a, a constant source of inspiration to me fantastic and how about yourself see oh, parents as well i mean my parents i've had a um an interesting career a lot of little cul-de-sacs I've had some real reversals that um, they helped me weather um, and I think you know that's that's important in terms of of women in STEM obviously I, I love Ada Lovelace when I started Ada Lovelace I didn't really know who she was I'm, I'm gonna confess that the more I read about her the more I think she was um, she was an astonishing woman and what I love about her is she she just wasn't scared of the strange places that uh, her, her imagination was leading to. So, you know, when you think about in context, the way that she thought about the analytical engine, she didn't sort of second guess herself and go, well, machines can't produce novel results. And that's not possible because, you know, at that time, machines couldn't. She just went with it and said, right, OK, step A, step B, let's follow this logically. Where does this end up? That's new and interesting. And, and she just had that confidence in herself. Um, and another woman that I really um, provided me with a lot of comfort because when I moved to America, my husband started his job on the 9th of February, 2014, but I still didn't have a visa and I didn't get a visa for another five months. And that time apart was quite difficult, um, especially as the last kind of six weeks of it was me couch surfing because we'd, we'd sent all of our stuff to America and I had nowhere um, permanent to live. And Qian Xiong Wu was a physicist who went to America um, to do a PhD just before the Second World War broke out. And she ended up working with Enrico Fermi and, and, and various other people. And, and she was quite a, a brilliant physicist in her own right, but she didn't see her family for eight years. And that story at that time, she was the role model I needed. She was the person that kind of went, look, you know, if she can get through eight years of not seeing her, her loved ones, then I can manage five months when I've got Skype and Messenger and email and everything. It's not that bad. And so I think sometimes role models really are down to um, your experience right now and finding someone who has been through similar. Absolutely. No, I really agree with that. And contextual, there's no harm in kind of actually, I really relate with this one person and actually kind of going on a journey as well. So no, I really, really resonate with that. Um, another question we've had is, um, do you think awareness training or policy change will make the biggest difference to removing barriers or equality in the workplace? Obviously a very big question. Um, Sue, would you like to take that first? Yes, I, I have very strong views on this. Um, I do not believe that uh, implicit bias training and awareness training is 
either effective or sufficient. Um, there are a lot of questions about whether implicit bias training actually works or whether there's a backfire effect that people feel, well, I've done my training, there's nothing I can do now could possibly be biased. And there is some kind of evidence that that, that is the case. Um, but on a more pragmatic level, um, we need to look at policies uh, and government policy, academic, business policy. And I mean, at a really granular level, because you can do all the implicit bias training that you like. If your, ad, uh, your job ad writing skills still say, you know, your job ad still says, you know, we are looking for a rock star programmer who works hard and plays hard. You are filtering women out of your applications before they have even read past that sentence. So until we have awareness around how to write job ads, how to um, de, uh, de bias your hiring process, until we have uh, really examined how promotions happen. We know, for example, a large part of the gender pay gap is down to not enough senior women and too many junior women. So we clearly, as a nation, have a problem with promoting women. So how do we fix that? Um, maternity leave, paternity leave, which is even more important. One of the biggest predictors as to whether a woman goes back to work after she's had a family is whether... Uh, there is paternity leave for her husband. So there's all this policy stuff that just is, is sitting there waiting to be fixed. And it's a relatively simple thing to fix. Changing the way that people's minds work. I just don't believe that a three hour or a three day training session is going to change someone's biases for the rest of their life. I just don't think that's possible. Whereas if you change your handbook about how you write job descriptions, that change is done. Any new person that comes into your company and uh, you is going to write a job description. They've got that those guidelines. They're going to do it to spec. You've you've solved that problem. So for me, it's like we just need to spend a lot more time talking about policy and and look at how we use policy to mitigate implicit bias instead of trying to rewire everyone's brains. And how about yourself, Karen? How, um, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, well, uh, very little to add, add because I agree with uh, very much of, of what Sue says. I think one of the, my observations is that whenever you try and change policy, which I have been involved with at the university several times, you know, with various things, you will get a challenge um, from people who don't understand why you're changing that policy and actually having the open discussion, you know, so you present a policy, it gets challenged, you openly discuss why the, why the challenge is there and why the policy is needed. And that debate and that engagement about the policy is just as important as the policy itself yeah. and is more impactful than training because Sue's absolutely right, people, people can, I mean, training does raise awareness and I wouldn't say don't do the training. I'd say that the training in particularly unconscious bias training has, has, does have an effect on some people who don't, aren't aware of their biases. So it can have a good effect, but it also for some people it can lead to a tick box. I've done that, I'm, I'm, I'm cured mentality. Um, but you know, actually having those open discussions and allowing people to challenge and then allowing other people to debate, you know, has a really impactful effect in it and that can change minds. Uh, and I think it's absolutely right that we should review policies. If we think about the policies and processes, you know, the modern policies and processes about employment, you know, it's changed so much in the last year, few years, and that is leading us towards equality. I also think, you know, I mean, a lot of companies ask me to advise them on how they can, um, you know, have, employ more women at higher levels. And you have to be attractive to women because women, is, women in STEM are, are rare, you know, let's face it. And, and so women in STEM need to be attracted and retained. So for any company, you know, it's about it's about recruitment, it's about retention and it's about promotion and you need to make sure and you won't retain women if you don't have a good workplace. So making sure your workplace is, um, it, you know, it, it is, is an attractive place and then that benefits everybody. Yeah. You know, these changes that we've put in place over over many years to benefit women, they, they've benefited to society. You know, they've made our workplaces better places. So, you know, really, really important to, to go for policy changes. Fantastic. 
Um, we've probably got time for probably half a question more before we have to wrap up for today. But I just wanted to ask you both, if you had any kind of other things that you'd like to add in terms of different simple actions we can take today to remove these barriers that we've kind of touched on slightly in this uh, in this webinar. Um, Sue, would you like to take that first? Yeah, I think, and I, I would speak very uh, warmly to the men on this call and the men watching that there is a lot that you can do um, and, and it's it's not necessarily big or scary or complicated. One of the key things that men can do is listen in meetings to who is speaking. And I challenge you all, the next meeting that you're in, get yourself like a, a piece of paper or a document on your iPad and just map out who speaks to who and who interrupts who and, and what their gender is because you will find that women speak a lot less than you think they do, and they get interrupted a lot more than men do. And from there, start to think about, well, when women are being interrupted, how can I uh, help them to be heard? And simple things to do there is to just say, oh, sorry, um, could I just hear what uh, Hannah had to say? And just provide that quiet support uh, to women, because, we are actually really quite fed up of being constantly interrupted in meetings. And if there was one thing that you could fix today, it would be to find that, that way, a comfortable way for you to support women when they are speaking. Um, that's, that, there's a lot more that, that we can do, but that would be the one I'd say start with. Fab. And yourself, Karen? Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I'd also add, um, think about sponsorship, and I don't mean financial sponsorship, but um, one of the observations that there's been a lot of um, research published on this, that, you know, it's, it's the extension of mentorship and it's, you know, putting forward women for um, key roles and supporting them in those key roles. And, you know, it's quite often um, the fact that men will put forward men, but they won't put forward women. So, you know, think about actually, it doesn't mean that you can't put forward men, you know, I'm just not saying that, but I'm just saying, think about the number of people you put forward for roles and whether they, there is a good gender balance and whether you're reflecting the skill base of the people you're putting forward to whether you're really looking for the skills or whether you're just looking for people like you. <clears throat> Thank you very much both. Um, I am afraid we are out of time today, although I've really appreciated, I'm sure audience members have as well, uh, both Karen and Sh Sue sharing your insights and experience on such an important topic. And I hope everyone has someone, something to take away from this conversation, both as food for thought, but also hope for the future. Um, if you are an alumnus of the university and have a topic that you'd like to pitch for our four alumni, by alumni series, either a live webinar such as this or a written blog in our monthly e-news, please do get in touch and the details of how to do that will be in our follow-up email. Uh, we do also hope you'll join Cardiff University for another virtual event. Our next four alumni by alumni live event is on Tuesday the 22nd of April at five, half past five again, asking the question, has COVID-19 made us more or less sustainable? Um, in addition, the university's main building will turn yellow this evening in memory of those who have lost their lives to COVID-19, which adds to the UK's moment of silence at noon today to mark one year of lockdown. Um, you'll receive an email in the next few days, as I said, with a copy of the recording and links to register for upcoming events. And most of all, thank you so much to Karen and Sue for sharing their expertise so gen generously, Jokobo Yaon. And thanks also to you, our audience, for joining us and asking such important important questions. Thank you again. Jokovar, a hoil Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Jokovar.